Welcome to the course on welding, cutting, and hot work. I am Marcus Wiesaw, your instructor for the course. And if you have any questions throughout the course as you move through the material, feel free to call me directly or email me, whatever is more convenient for you, and I'll try to respond and get some more information to you. My contact information is listed on the screen for that purpose. Let's go over the welding, cutting, and hot work objectives. There are four primary objectives I want you to be able to accomplish by the end of this course. Firstly, I want you to be able to list and describe the dangers of welding, cutting, and hot work. I want you to understand the duties and responsibilities of the fire watch. I want you to be able to identify cylinders that are improperly stored and name five hazards of welding operations. Hot work, fire, and explosive dangers. Workers performing hot work, such as welding, cutting, brazing, soldering, and grinding, are exposed to the risk of fires from ignition of flammable or combustible materials in the space and from leaks of flammable gas into the space from the hot work equipment. There are several precautions or basic precautions for fire prevention with respect to hot work. Performing hot work in a safe location and with fire hazards removed is of the utmost importance. We want you to always use guards to confine heat, sparks, and slag and to protect the immovable fire hazards if there are any. Do not perform hot work where flammable vapors or combustible materials exist. Work and equipment should be relocated outside of the hazardous areas whenever that is possible. Make suitable fire extinguishing equipment immediately available. This equipment can consist of pails of water, buckets of sand, a hose, or portable ABC fire extinguisher. And always assign a fire watch. The fire watch duties are pretty simple. The primary objective of having a fire watch is to have an individual there who can extinguish a fire, sound an alarm if a fire gets out of hand, and basically assist somebody else doing hot work with the uh, fire prevention initiatives. So the fire watch duties are to have fire extinguishing equipment readily available and be trained in its use. So fire watch has to be trained and has to be competent in being a fire watch. The fire watch must be familiar with facilities for sounding an alarm in the event of a fire. The fire watch must watch for fires in all exposed areas, try to extinguish them only when obviously within the capacity of the equipment available or otherwise sound the alarm. For example, if we have a 20 pound ABC fire extinguisher, we know that we're limited to about oh, 30, 35 seconds of dry powder chemical for perhaps a nine square foot area. So something uh, requiring more extinguishment power than that would, would be caused to sound an alarm and a fire watch would know that. Uh, maintain the fire watch at least a half an hour after completion of welding or cutting operations or any other type of spark producing hot work to detect and extinguish possible smoldering fires. Atmospheric monitoring is sometimes required, especially if the hot work is going to be completed inside a confined space. And so we monitor with, usually it's a four gas monitor that we use, and we test the atmosphere inside confined spaces or wherever it's applicable. And we set the alarm, or usually they come stock right out of the box, with an alarm that's going to go off uh, at 10% of the lower explosive level or LEL and if the alarm does sound the work must be stopped. I do want to make a note here that sometimes uh, instead of lower explosive level or LEL you might be uh, inclined to see LFL which is the same thing and it means lower flammability level. Welding, cutting, and brazing. All hot work is potentially dangerous and a hazard assessment should be performed to determine where hazards exist. Here are some potential hazards. Welding fumes, 
UV lights or ultraviolet lights, sparks, noise, and skinned injuries. Other hazards of hot work operations. Fire hazards, metal splatter, electric shock, explosion hazards, released gases, and radiant energy. There are three basic types of welding, gas arc and oxy and arc cutting. Gas welding is slower and easier to control than electrical arc welding. It uses a gas flame over metals until molten puddle is formed. The most popular fuels used with oxygen include acetylene, MAP gas, and hydrogen. Arc welding is where two metals are joined by generating an electric arc between a covered metal electrode and the base metal. And oxygen and arc cutting welding is metal cutting and welding is the severing or removal of metal by a flame or arc. The, there are best practices for welding, cutting, and brazing. And so what I'd like to do is go over a few common general industry best practices that are adopted and accepted throughout all different types of organizations. So firstly, we want to inspect the work area to make sure that all fuel and ignition sources are isolated by shielding or clearing the area, uh, lock, performing lockout tag out wherever that's necessary, and soaking flammable material with water. We want everyone, including the fire watch and the welder or, or whoever's performing the work, to wear appropriate personal protective equipment, such as a face shield, uh, leather welder's vest, and gauntlet gloves. I uh, use cotton or denim clothing whenever possible. Uh, provide UV shielding for arc welding where practical for employee protection. We want to inspect welding and cutting equipment prior to use, especially for arc or gas welding or burning. We want to frequently leak test gas torches, gauges, and hoses. We want to review the hot work permit whenever that's required and make sure that everyone involved with the hot work understands the permit. Ensure the availability of adequate fire watch and fire protection equipment. Okay, one thing I want to make a note on is the fire watch is not considered a welder's helper. It's an easy but very important job and uh, the fire watch typically uh, is going to kind of stand around and make sure that uh, no fires uh, become started and if they do uh, the fire watch is going to go and extinguish those fires or sound the alarm and we kind of discussed the duties of the fire watch again and I want to make a note here that we didn't put the fire watch duty as go get the welder a sandwich go get the welder a tool or anything like that so we need to be very distinct on that because it's a frequently cited OSHA violation and uh, it's an easy one to comply with and to avoid. And finally, the last best practice is to ensure adequate ventilation from toxic welding and cutting fumes. Special hazards. There are special hazards that do occur frequently with welding, cutting, and brazing. Accumulation of toxic gases within a confined space is very common because usually tanks, silos, and, and other types of confined spaces can house different types of flammable liquids or toxic gases depending on what the use is of the tank. And so that is a special concern and special consideration that we must take when welding, cutting, or brazing in those kind of uh, work environments. A hazardous atmosphere exists in oxygen deficient and oxygen enriched environments. Now OSHA has defined oxygen deficiency as an environment that contains less than 19.5% by volume of oxygen. Conversely, OSHA has considered and defined oxygen enrichment at an atmospheric concentration of greater than 23.5% oxygen by volume. So what we have here is we have a workable range. So if you measured the atmosphere now for oxygen content, you're going to come up with 20.9% or roughly 21% oxygen by volume. And so what we have here from OSHA's perspective is a range. We may work in an environment 
that has at least 19.5% oxygen, but no greater than 23.5% oxygen, both uh, concentrations by volume. And so when we do atmospheric measuring, like we discussed with the lower explosive limit, we will also get a readout from that foregas monitor on oxygen deficiency or oxygen enrichment. So in other words, it's going to give us a readout of what the percent by volume is. And if it's outside of this acceptable range, we have to either purge the system or find a way to uh, work in that environment that's both legal and safe. Possible solutions to these types of hazards include ventilating toxic metal fumes mechanically, uh, using a written permit system or hot work permit to document authorization to enter to do the work and uh, log the gas monitoring results uh, where there's the potential for toxic flammable or an oxygen deficient atmosphere. And I do want to make a note that you may use the confined space permit or or and or actually a uh, hot work permit. So you could use a hot work permit only or you could use a confined space permit only if you're going to be doing welding in a confined space. But nonetheless, just having some kind of written permit system is incredibly important and it's a great step towards keeping everyone safe and avoiding unnecessary incidents and employee accidents. Cylinder storage. Cylinder storage is probably one of the biggest uh, violations that I see in almost every industry. So here's some good ideas on how to properly store cylinders. Ensure cylinders are properly stored in an upright position and chained in separate racks. Store full and empty cylinders separately. Uh, potential hazards include valve opening or breaking off, exposing workers to toxic fumes and flammable gases caused by improper gas cylinder storage. And one of the things I want to mention to you, it's kind of a fun thing. If you're familiar with that show called Mythbusters, uh, they did take an acetylene gas cylinder and they knocked the regulator off of it and addressed the myth of whether or not an acetylene cylinder will go through a brick wall. And what they found out was that it does. And so if you want to visit YouTube or go online and seek out that episode of Mythbusters, very interesting, very real, and I think it will put everything into greater perspective for you on why storing cylinders, especially acetylene, is incredibly important. Cylinder storage best practices. Store cylinders in a dry, well-ventilated location. Avoid storing flammable substances in the same area as gas cylinders. Avoid storing cylinders of oxygen within 20 feet of cylinders containing flammable gases, such as acetylene. Store all cylinders upright and chained in separate racks, and store full and empty cylinders separately. So let's look at some photographs of improper storage. So as you can see here, we have different uh, compressed gas cylinders stored near each other inappropriately. Now if one of these were to tip over or if there were some kind of um, ignition source here, we'd have a, a very big problem. Uh, here we see somebody working uh, and cutting possibly way too close to the bottles. Now we don't know if this is certain that these sparks will act as an ignition source. But is the potential there? Is there a possibility there? Yes, there is. Here we see a defective hose. I see this all the time. I can go into just about any welding shop, including colleges, schools, and uh, almost always find some kind of defective hose. One of the best preventative measures for uh, identifying defective hoses is just to simply inspect the hoses prior to use but most people don't want to take that extra step to do so. So let's look at some common OSHA violations just to wrap up this presentation. It's always better to look at some of this stuff especially with welding, cutting, and brazing so you can get a good idea of um, what's wrong and what's right. And so here we see improper storage. We see a bunch of compressed gas cylinders 
uh, basically tied together with one chain so we have we don't have a separation there that's required again we have uh, we have two uh, compressed gas cylinders or maybe three there that are chained uh, properly and we have this one closest to the sign that says flammable fire or flammable keep uh, fire away and that's not chained at all okay so that does have that particular compressed gas cylinder has no uh, has no protective chain around it to keep it from falling uh, here we see uh, a, an example of improper storage yet again of oxygen and acetylene being right next to each other here we see a bunch of compressed gas cylinders again improperly stored uh, kind of bunched up in one location and hopefully if your work environment looks like this that this will help you say hey maybe we need to, to correct that and if you need any help on that just uh, let me know uh, again we we see yet another example of a, a similar setting so you can see that as we go through different organizations it's it's very common for compressed gas cylinders to be uh, stored improperly and so it's incredibly common and so if you need any help with that or want to know how to appropriately address that uh, feel free to call or email me and we can discuss it further and finally, this is one of my favorites. What we have here is we have a forklift operator who decided to move some compressed gas cylinders. And you can see that we have uh, at least two there visible in this photograph uh, being uh, carried on a, uh, looks like an extended boom forklift. And if the operator were to uh, basically drop that, it could become a rocket. It could explode we could have a lot of different issues here and so uh, this is a handling and a storage issue and so very dangerous and uh, let's try to avoid things like that so nonetheless it's been a very thorough conversation on welding cutting brazing and hot work <laughs>it reminds us of driver's licenses or other type of permits that allow us to do certain things. The program today focuses on work permits, but they're designed for the safety of those working on a project or those people working near a particular project. There are several types of permits, so let's begin the program by discussing safety permits. Of course, the purpose of a permitting procedure is to make sure personnel and equipment are protected and safety procedures are communicated with all personnel including contractors and is designed to establish uniform safety procedures throughout the entire work area when using a permit system shortcuts cannot be taken and the procedures for the permit must not be compromised each company has different rules and procedures for permitting therefore it's imperative that anyone issuing a permit follow your company's procedures exactly. Generally, a permit is issued for only a short period of time, which can be two hours, eight hours, or 24 hours. However, work permits are never issued for more than 24 hours. If work requiring the permit takes more than 24 hours, a new permit should be issued by the authorizing person. All work permits must be signed and countersigned by employees. The authorized person who issued the permit must sign the permit. In other words, to be a valid permit, it must be signed by the person authorized to issue permits and also by those people who will be using the permit for their work. And both should be involved in the inspection of the area where the work will be performed. During the inspection, both persons are aware of the conditions for which the permit is issued and what specific safety precautions must be taken. This is an effective communication method to make sure everyone understands what is required to complete the job safely. First of all, one of the most important permits that is generally used is the hot work permit. The name implies hot work, therefore you can conclude it would include welding, cutting, brazing, and other similar work. Hot work is basically defined as 
any operation or job which could provide, become, or create an ignition source for any flammable material. Some examples of hot work include electrically driven power tools, acetylene burning, welding or brazing, electrical or arc welding, soldering, chipping of metal, and use of open flames. In some areas, electronic cameras and flashbulbs could create a hazard and would require a hot work permit. Even the operation of a motor-powered vehicle in a potentially hazardous environment might require a hot work permit. Let's go back just a second or so, as not to confuse the issue here. If the area you're working in is open and is specifically designated for the normal routine performance of hot work, such as welding, then hot work permits may not be required. Areas where permits are required could include those areas where there is a potential for flammable vapors being ignited by the hot work. Working near tank farm dikes, load racks, vapor recovery units, or within 50 feet of a potential hydrocarbon source requires a hot work permit. Generally, management must designate restricted areas and open areas in writing or designate these areas with a plot plan of the facility. Planning for hot work and hot work permits is extremely important. You must plan that the work is carried out safely and efficiently and must consider what equipment, testing, monitoring, and other measures are necessary to allow hot work in this specific area. Personnel authorized to sign and countersign hot work permits must be responsible for taking all precautionary measures required to prevent the danger of fires and explosions and to assure the safety of personnel and equipment within the specific area which the hot work permit covers. This includes, but is not limited to, ensuring the proper condition of equipment, appropriate fire protection, personal protection, and any other precautions that may apply. Some examples of these precautions include disconnecting, bleeding, steaming, draining, venting, inerting, cleaning, or air ventilation. It's a big responsibility because if the planning phase leaves out something or you haven't taken the time to think the hot work permit through, it could be disastrous. Okay. You have an understanding of what hot work is and basically why a hot work permit would be required. Let's now tackle an entry permit. An entry permit is generally required in confined spaces where the atmosphere or other environment conditions can be hazardous to your health and safety. Let's not confuse a hot work permit with an entry permit. Let's say that all confined spaces require an entry permit. This entry permit spells out what testing is required before entering, what specific safety measures and rescue procedures must be taken, and other responsibilities before anyone can enter the confined space. Okay, you've obtained an entry permit into a confined space, but does this give you the authority to do hot work in this confined space? The answer is no. You need a hot work permit and the entry permit. Let's quickly review some of the basic parts of a hot work permit. Each organization may have different requirements, but this will give you an idea of what is required in a hot work permit. This will permit identification of the person, group, or contractor authorized to do the work. Specific names are required. Two, this section identifies the ignition source and work that is to be done. This identifies the equipment to be worked on. Be sure to state the specific locations and or areas where the equipment to be worked on is located. From to. The from to section gives the specific time and date the work is to begin and end. It may also include an extension and expiration time. Some of the other sections that could be used on a hot work permit include the name of the product or chemical that the equipment last contained. Equipment condition, gas tests. People performing specific tests must record the time the tests are taken, the results, 
instrument numbers and signature of the tester. Fire protection. Personal protective equipment required. Other precautions. Signer. This is the person authorized in writing who can sign the permit. Cosigner. These are the additional employees authorized in writing to sign hot work permits. However, the same person cannot sign and co-sign the permit. The acknowledgement section is signed by the person to whom the permit is issued to acknowledge understanding of the conditions and limitations on the permit. Return of permits means all permits must be returned to the issuing party. When it is returned, the name of the party returning the permit, the time and date will be recorded in the permit book. That person will also note the status of the job. Hot work permits and confined space entry permits are two different types of permits, each involving different methods and procedures, but in reality they're closely related. Both permit systems are designed to prevent accidents, injuries, explosions, and other hazards. Don't take the permit system lightly, because a properly executed permit can save your life. Again, we've only covered the basics of two permit systems, hot work and entry permits. Your organization may have additional requirements, and they may even have permits of a different nature, such as a safe work permit required for building a scaffold, or operation of a crane, or other types of work. Permits are for your protection. Follow your company's procedures exactly and to the letter. If you're required to test the oxygen level in a confined space before an entry permit is issued, then don't allow the permit to be issued or anyone to enter the confined space until the testing procedure is completed and certified it's safe to issue the permit and enter the confined space. If you're required to get a permit, do it before you begin the work. It's the only safe thing to do.